Well, we have been in a series where we're talking about rhythms, how certain things fit into your life. And today I'm going to talk about how faith can fit into your life, specifically faith in terms of spiritual practice. So whenever I say faith, that's what I mean. I mean spiritual practice. And this should be pretty easy to talk to you about just by the fact that you're here. You are somewhat interested in how faith fits into your life, unless, of course, your mom drug you here, or someone else drug you here for that matter. Welcome to you. Uh, Hopefully, by the end of this talk, Christianity won't seem as unapproachable as you might have thought. So we're going to dive in. I think we're going to have a lot of fun this morning. Um, First, a word to anyone here who thinks they have this topic all locked down. I've, I've done a bit of formal counseling and a lot of informal counseling, specifically in the area of relationships. And whenever I'm talking to someone who's going through marital, tr- marital trouble uh, and actually playing around with the idea of leaving their spouse, I have a few things that I can say that are like mic drop comments, uh, kill shots, if you will. Is it okay to use sniper metaphors? Uh, I think it is. Okay. Uh, Uh, they aren't always the right thing to say. You should never use kill shots to make yourself feel better, but sometimes they get right to the heart of the matter and uh, make a person rethink their trajectory. So every once in a while, I'm in one of these conversations, someone who is just really tired of being married. Um, And it can get very surface level, and the person I'm talking to will say something like, you know, I've known this person for 20 years or however long. And uh, I'll say just a quick prayer and see if it's time for a kill shot. And if it is, uh, I'll, I'll kind of sit back, fold my hands and say, you've known them for 20 years. Does that mean you know everything about them? Maybe you just stopped being curious. And uh, you can use that, you can use that uh, on other people for sure. I've used it on myself just to make sure I'm approaching my marriage correctly. I've been married for 19 years. No, 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 no. I've known my wife for 19 years. Been kissing her for 16, been married for 12. There we go. Um, and, uh, and I'll tell you, after 19 years, she becomes more and more of a mystery to me every day. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Never stop being curious, right? Uh, Why do I say this? I see a similar trend in faith. There's this very common progression. Number one, become a Christian and get really excited. Number two, a goal is developed rather quickly to become an expert Christian. Number three, we become an expert Christian. Number four, lose curiosity because we have it all figured out. And you may be here today and think you're an expert. And let me tell you, that's the first sign that you're probably not an expert. Uh, It's interesting to me when I meet someone who excels above everyone else in their field, um, that there's usually a steady confidence um, paired with an insatiable hunger to learn. And some of the most excellent people I've ever met have this beautifully developed, quiet, humility that's not forced. It's just part of who they are. I realized I wasn't an expert Christian when the things that bothered me 10 years ago still bother me. I realized I wasn't an expert Christian when I saw anyone who doesn't believe the same way as me as less than. I realized I wasn't an expert Christian when I found myself thinking that certain people deserved love more than other types of people. Like maybe the poor deserve more love than the rich. I found myself um, working in a church in the western suburbs of, uh, of Minneapolis with everyone was uh, corporate level enterprise executives. And some of these people were paying $65,000 a year in taxes just on their in property taxes on their house because of the size and where it was. And the church that I was at before then was a church in downtown Minneapolis and 
we primarily serve the poorest of the poor. And I found myself being very judgmental of these new people that uh, I had chosen to work with and to serve. Um, do they deserve love any less? No. Do I maybe have to love them a different way? Yes. And that's heavy. But what's worse than going deep too fast, if, if this message was a scuba dive right now, you'd probably all have embolism. But the, what's worse than going deep too fast is thinking I'm a deep person when in reality I've only touched the surface. And I'm happy to stay in that illusion. I've had the privilege of knowing and befriending many 80 plus year olds. I'm 32. And I, I consider it one of my life's greatest privileges to be around people of that age who not only tolerate me, but love me, offer their wisdom. Uh, some are still alive and well, some I've said goodbye to. A few years ago, I asked one of these friends, Don, Don Lundquist, who had been a pastor for 60 years, what he was reading. He loved to read. And he responded, well, I'm reading a book about forgiveness. I think it's about time I start to learn about that. He was 79. So I'd love for us to shed our know-it-all ideals. If you've got them, shed them. I'll shed mine. And uh, hopefully we'll do some growing today. Today I want to explore uh, simple spiritual practices that make a big difference in your life. There are a lot of spiritual practice, practices, ways that you can get yourself into a spot where you can experience God on a deeper level in a new way. Um, and I, we don't have time to cover all of them this morning. So if you're like a fasting junkie, like not eating, like not eating is the way to get close to God, I think, I think that's a great practice. It's, for me, it's always a bummer. We're not, we're not going to talk about it today. Maybe we'll talk about it some other time. Um, uh, what I want to do is, um, if you're new to this journey, if you've never taken a step towards Jesus Christ before, uh, uh, if you've been doing this for a long time even, um, I want us to walk out of here with some, real, some things we can use in our day-to-day -day life, some things that don't take any prep work, no juicing, no, no anti-meal planning, uh, but things that um, hopefully will get you to approach God in a new way. Maybe uh, something that will pull you out of a rut. Maybe something that will get you to view a practice you've been practicing for a long time in a new way. Okay? So, first... Um, what ranking does God have in my life? As Americans, we uh, live in a very linear society. We like to rank things. We have a top 10 list for everything. And very often in Christian circles, I've heard this little ranking system for how spirituality fits into our lives. Maybe you could help me with it. Um, God, first. Family, second. Work, third, etc., etc., etc. If only it was that tidy, right? I find myself... Uh, going work first, family second, because I, I have to pick up the kids. They can't just stay there at school. <laughs> and then sp spirituality comes into it when I'm praying for patients when they're going bonkers in the back seat behind me. Um, but I, I just I have a hard time integrating that in this linear system. This is where God goes, this is where your family goes, and this is where your work goes, and you'll live a satisfying life. Uh, it's important to acknowledge that Christianity morphed out of Judaism, a religion firmly rooted in the Eastern world, where the worldview is much more circular, less linear. There aren't as many hard, fast lines drawn um, between certain things. Now, they still acknowledge things that are opposite from one another, good, evil, opposites. But things that fall on the side of good, they don't always have to compete with each other. In America, we view a lot of good things as competing with one another. I can't dive into this hobby too deeply because what if then I want to monetize it and then it becomes a chore just like my current job is, right? We think about those things. Um, in, in Eastern culture, you really don't think about that too much. Uh, right now, 
I, I hear a lot of people talk about boundaries. Boundaries, I think, are a useful tool to bring some balance in your life, but I think what we're all craving is balance and an integrated life that works well, where all the little pieces work well together. They make sense um, uh, when you put them together. Uh, how does God fit into our life? Matthew 22 37 through 39 says, when Jesus was asked uh, what the greatest commandment was, he responded, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's pretty big. Um, If you're here and you're asking who is God, you're not alone in that question. Humanity throughout all of history has asked who is God. A good place to start is 1 John 4, 8 says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So love God with all, God is love. In a way, it's kind of like saying love, love. What about, what about love the embodiment of love with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? I don't know about you, but that sounds really big. and so all-encompassing that it can't even be a central role. You know, because it wraps everything else up around it. It can't be things on the outskirts of that. Oh, God is central. We say that too. Oh, God needs to be the center of your life and then everybody else is on the outside. That doesn't work. I've tried that and then everybody else gets left out while I'm pursuing God, but part of pursuing God is bringing everybody else into it. And it can be a little overwhelming living a life that's that all-encompassing when you're welcoming God into everything. But thank goodness our spiritual journey is just that, a journey. A journey one step after another step after another. A journey in which one parable describes God as a shepherd who goes out to find sheep that have lost their way and brings them back to the fold. That's love, isn't it? I find that interesting that the shepherd goes out to bring the sheep back implying that the sheep were there at one point. That's a love that's patient and kind. That's a love I could learn to love with all of me. It's nice to know that in the midst of trying to love God, he's patient with the process. Yes? So on this journey, what are some simple practices we can have that put us in a place where we can interact with God? There's a a blank sheet of paper in your program if you came in and got that. And if you want to write these down, I'm not going to have them on the screen today, but um, I've got four things, four practices uh, that I'm going to share with you. And then I have three things I'm going to share with you at the end of signs that you might need to recalibrate your routine a little bit. So first one, Uh, first word is pray. I'll give you more. (laughs) There's, more, there's a phrase, but the first one, I'll say pray for right now. There's so much pressure about knowing what to pray and when and how. There are some people who are really good at praying that make you feel really bad at praying. Uh, uh, there's even this idea that someone can pray the wrong thing, then God will do what they ask, even if it violates his character. I don't think that's accurate. There's this great story in the Bible, uh, Jesus and his disciples weren't well received in a certain Samaritan village. James and John, a few of Jesus' disciples, immediate response was, let's call down fire from heaven and burn the city. (laughs) And Jesus rebuked them, and then they went on to a different place. What's the point? God knows what's best for all of humanity. And I don't see how he would ever respond to a prayer that violates his own character, okay? Sometimes uh, I've seen seen people in a prayer time together. One guy will pray something. Guy A will pray something that guy B does not agree with. Guy A will say amen. Guy B will start to pray, pushing his own agenda against guy A, telling him how he was wrong. But it's all kind of directed at God, (laughs) kind of, all right? Um, I, I, think, I think God knows how to sift through those things. And I, I think God won't listen to us, you know, just 
pushing our own agenda. Maybe he's more concerned about his own. The restoration of all things. I have a, I have a son, um, Gabriel, who's five. And Gabe, when he gets really stoked, he stammers. He stammers. He can't get the words out. And he'll come, he'll come up to me, Dad, I, I, and it's just this thing. And so I wait, and usually making eye, eye contact helps. Um, and I wait for him to say what he has to say. And oftentimes, in the midst of the stammering, I'm already starting to gather pieces of what he's trying to say to me. I kind of feel like God's in that. I feel like in the midst of our stammering, God knows what our heart is trying to say to him. It doesn't always have to be delivered the right way. You wrote down pray, add to that open-ended prayers. Pray open-ended prayers. Don't feel like you need to put a happy little bow on every prayer you pray. At the end of a busy day, I'll get into a quiet place and I'll pray something like this. God, there was something I wanted to say to you today, but there were places to go and people to see and things to do, and I have forgotten what that was. Can you show me what it was I was trying to say when I woke up this morning? when I was driving in the car, but I got distracted. That is a way to open my heart and my mind to him. It's a way to get my mind off of myself and create an environment where I don't have to have all the answers. Because I don't need to. You don't need to. You don't need to convince God of anything. I heard this great quote um, that begging God to do something good assumes that you care about that thing more than he does. Blew my mind. The nature of him being a good father, caring about the big things and the little things alike, put us in a place where we don't have to beg. We can pray open-ended prayers. We don't have to have it all figured out. Number two, practice silence. In our day-to-day lives, we rarely have any silent time. You came to church. You're not getting any quiet time at all. I'm talking at you. you we, we, uh, in church, we, we rarely make time for quiet. So if you're going to get it, you kind of have to get it on your own. The voice of God has been described in the Bible as a still, small voice. If we don't cultivate quiet, it could be difficult to hear what God may want to say to us. So a very simple way to cultivate quiet is just to focus on breathing. And if you're here thinking that I'm going to go down some weird new agey track, you can go, you can just relax, loosen your seatbelt a little bit. We've all benefited from breathing from time to time. You're a human being, not a human doing. And a great way to disconnect from the doing side, even for a moment, is to do nothing but focus on the action that is keeping you alive. And in that, maybe we can find just enough quiet to hear what God wants to say to us. Set a time, five minutes. Move into a quiet place where you're not going to get interrupted. Maybe you got to sit in your car, in the parking lot after work for five minutes before you put your foot on the gas. If other thoughts come into your head, I, well, my practice is I say hello to them. You don't want to see inside my head. I say hello to them, and then I say goodbye to them and send them on their way. I, uh, uh, interesting thing that happened to me a couple years ago. I was really trying to dive into being quiet, to bring quiet into my life. I had, I was going through this horrible season of anxiety in my life, and, um, and quiet is a really good way to address that. If I called for a raise of hands right now of who on a weekly basis or even a daily basis 
um, feels fear or anxiety, um, I think a lot of hands would go up. This is a great way to address that and bring God into that space with you. I noticed a couple years ago when I was doing this that I'd have, um, I'd have people, people's names come into my mind. Oftentimes, I would remember that I needed to call somebody back. It was the weirdest deal, and I kept trying to push it all out and go, no, no, I'm trying to focus on God now. That's not, that's not welcome. I'm just here. I'm here. <sighs> right? Like trying to get that away. And then I started paying attention to the trends of that. And it was always calling people back, getting back in touch with people who I'd promised I'd get a hold of. And what I, the sense that I got was, oh, God, you're looking out for my reputation Every time. And I, I, it'd be somebody that I told them, I, I call, I'll, call you in, I'll call you tomorrow. And it's been a couple weeks. And I think, for me, that was interesting to see, oh, in, even in the midst of my agenda to practice silence and quiet, God is going, hey, all right, I'll take this time to maybe remind you of something that's important. How you maybe, you know, can heal this relationship. And I was... Keep your word. Interesting thought. Uh, number three, read the Bible in a different way. In rabbinic studies of the Bible, they do this thing called turning the gem. Um, I don't spend a lot of time holding diamonds on a daily basis, but when you hold it, when you like, say you hold a wedding ring, right? You look at it and what do you do? You turn it. You look at it from different angles. You see how the light reflects this whole new thing appears before you as you turn the gem. Well, when rabbis are studying the Bible, leading people through it, they call it turning the gem. You look at the story in the Bible from different angles, maybe see it in a different way. We live in a day where there's so many translations of the Bible, it gives us a lot of ways to read it. And I want to encourage you not to get hung up on which translation you use. The, the original Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic texts communicate things far more intricately than English could ever convey them. There's so many cultural intricacies in the Bible that are not explained because the writer assumed the people reading it would know what they meant. But we don't because it's 2017 and we live in the United States of America. So there's a lot to explore. If you come to a spot in the Bible that's weird, chances are the author is trying to get your attention. I came to this place in the Old Testament where they were talking about Moses' death, who's a father of the faith, Moses. Um, guy, you know, like split the Red Sea and all of the, all the people of Israel stepped across on dry land. If that's not weird... If you don't think that's weird, and I would love to see the life that you live. <laughs> but they get to the end of Moses' life, and the author throws in this little, this little tidbit. And Moses was, however many years, when he died, and he still had his moisture. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like, what? That's weird. I'm not going to unpack it today. But there, I would encourage you to just go find that story and then look up what moisture meant and how it has all of these cultural connotations for the day and age that Moses was living in and why it was important. The Bible is full of stuff like that. If you've been to at least three weddings, you've heard 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. In the NIV, uh, the New International Version is probably the most popular translation of the Bible, it reads this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. A different translation, the message translation says, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Oof. Love doesn't strut. Love doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first. 
doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Isn't that beautiful? One more, the Passion Translation. Love waits patiently for God's timing. Love is gentle and shows kindness to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seeks its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love finds delight in the truth, not in what is wrong. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things, and still remains strong. Turn the gem, explore what the Bible may be saying from different angles, and if you come to a place that's really weird, chances are the author is trying to say something to you. You'd be surprised. Number four, ponder on small pieces of scripture. When I was growing up, I heard a ready fire aim evangelist say, if you're not reading three chapters of the Bible a day, how can you, how can you call yourself a Christian? Oof. I was 12. I was sitting in this room. I had a deep love for God. I wanted to learn more about him. And that statement created so much anxiety in me and obligation around reading the Bible that I struggled with it well into my adult years until I finally found some freedom around it again. I want to give you permission to just focus on a small piece. If opening the Bible feels daunting to you and you feel like you have to read a whole chapter or more to make it count, that's not how the Bible was written. It was written so that you could read it and it could change your life. And when you go to read something with an with a spirit of obligation, it just hurts you and it's not healthy. I wonder what this church, as a group of people who are seeking after God, would look like if we decided to ponder on love never gives up, love cares more for others than self, love doesn't want what it doesn't have. For a year. I'm not mandating that. But what would happen? I'm curious about what would happen. What would our relationships look like? What would people's experience of us look like? Those people that we meet outside of these walls, the place where we'd spend most of our time outside these walls. Of course, if your hunger is driving you to read more of the Bible, do it. Do it. But don't underestimate the power of focusing on a little bit until it becomes a part of who you are. Another way of looking at that would be if when you're reading the Bible, it's not changing who you are or becoming a part of who you are, maybe you're not reading it the right way. It's an amazing book and it's oftentimes gravely misunderstood. It's used to win arguments it's, when it's used um, in a political fashion to say, I'm right and you're wrong. It's not what it's for. For me, it changes my life every time I read it. So a recap. Pray open-ended prayers. Practice silence. Read the Bible in a new way. Turn the gem. And ponder on small pieces of scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. A few signs now as we close, a few signs to know you need to recalibrate. What, how do I know my current rhythm isn't working? Um, I'll move through, th through these pretty quickly, okay? Your spiritual routine leaves you feeling inadequate, guilty, or anxious. 
We've talked about this a bit already. Be sensitive to it. If you feel yourself moving into any of those feelings, um, you need to know it's very unhealthy. Um, That isn't the heart of God. This whole spiritual journey is supposed to be life-giving. In the Bible, um, Jesus says, cast your cares upon me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Spirituality, the Christian life, is all about Casting your burdens away, not pursuing him and then taking on more. Number two, you're an expert. Always be in a mode of learning. If you feel you have nothing else to learn, hang on tight, my friend, because you're in for a wild ride. I thought when I was 25, I kid you not, I had this thought. Man, God... So much has happened in my heart and my life that I think I'm probably good for the next 10 years. <laughs> and then what followed was just, I, I don't know if God intentionally did that or if it was just life hearing me say that and attacking me for it. But I, the, the things that happened in the next two years were just so brutally disruptive that I go, oh, all right, I, I won't ever think that again ever. If you feel like an expert, it could be a symptom of you being stuck. I've been there. You need to know that there's grace for you. You're still loved. You're going to be okay. Maybe an open-ended prayer you could pray is, God, I feel like a know-it-all. Can you fix that? Last one. Um, Other people's doubts scare you. Right now, many of my close personal friends are going through what I would call a deconstruction in their faith, um, where they're shedding a lot of things that uh, aren't foundational to their to their Christian life um, and rediscovering the person of Jesus Christ in a pure new way. My fundamentalist Christian friends would say they're one step away from atheism. But uh, I think they'd be wrong. A new friend was telling me about their faith journey. He said, I was a middle-aged, devout Southern Baptist. I was reading the Bible from cover to cover. One year, I read it cover to cover five times. And then he looks at me like... He wants me to tell him to keep going. And so I go, and and he goes, and I became an atheist. You can't read the Bible that much. And I just, knowing his whole story, I laughed. But he was an atheist for five years until he had this crazy experience on a beach in Naples, Florida. I kid you not. He turns white as a ghost whenever he tells the story where he saw this bright light and felt an overwhelming love just fill his soul and he knew it was Jesus Christ. That's part of his story. When you sense a person experiencing doubt, don't distance yourself from them. Don't go tell another friend, oh, they're struggling. Make sure they know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you love them. Be there for them. Don't try to get them to say the right thing. Don't try to win an argument. Jesus was a Jew. Something I've found fascinating is that Judaism doesn't ask Jews to give up their doubts and questions. That's a fundamental piece of their religion, which helps me make sense of the people that Jesus hung out with. He hung out with prostitutes, tax collectors who swindle poor people out of what few resources they have left and rough around the edges fishermen. We know a thing about those people around here, right? Those fishermen who remember I mentioned earlier wanted to call down fire from heaven on a town that wasn't warm and welcoming to them. Jesus rebukes them. No, guys, shut up. And then you know what he does in the very next verse? 
he goes and recruits more disciples. Not new ones, more. So let's just unpack Jesus' thought process here for a moment. We weren't warmly welcomed by this town. My guys wanted to call down fire from heaven and burn the city and all the people alive. I told them no, so it's okay. Something's working. Something's working. Let's get more guys. The disciples belonged before they believed. They were welcomed and they were loved before they got everything right. Oftentimes, not getting a lot right. We would do well to offer grace to others who don't have it all figured out and maybe offer ourselves some of that grace too, knowing that just like a plant, growth doesn't always look like progress. It's my prayer that in the days and weeks to come, you find yourself experiencing God in deeper ways than ever before, that you embrace the journey. There will be straight, smooth roads that just let you cruise. And there'll be rocky passes that seem like they take forever to navigate. But I pray you sense God with you. I pray you know others are with you too. This morning, uh, if you've heard us talking about Jesus, if you felt love, if you felt a burning in your heart, if you felt a desire to take that step to follow Jesus Christ, I'd be remiss to not extend an invitation as a representative of this family for you to just make that first step. And so... Um, you need to know that it's not a small thing. It's not something that you make on a whim. I've talked about it being a journey and up and down, right? But that first step that we have, we might know that it's gonna be a journey. We might know that it's not always gonna be easy, but that first step is really important. And so if we could all stand together if you're in that place and you say, I want to get on this path, um, I just want to ask everybody here to close your eyes. Um, and if that's you, if you've sensed a, a nudge in your heart to say, man, I want to be a part of that. I just want to encourage you right now to lift your hand. This isn't a notch in our belt. This isn't us trying, I see you, I see you, I see you. This isn't us trying to get you to subscribe to a club. This is way bigger than that. This is about your life being changed forever. This is about the current system that I'm using in my life just is not working. Anybody else? welcome. If you've been a Christian for a long time, if you've been doing this journey for a little bit now, or if you just raised your hand and you said, I want to do that, then pray this prayer with me. There's nothing magical about this prayer. This is just us saying, God, I'm starting. So dear Jesus, I see that I need you. I've, I see that I want to follow you. So I'm responding. And I invite you to renew my mind. I invite you to renew my heart. I welcome your love into my life. Knowing full well that it'll change me. Help me to receive your grace. Help me to get rid of the things that aren't working. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. After every service, we have people who are up front here who are willing to pray with you. If you 
decided to take that step this morning, tell somebody. I'll be up here. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to meet you. Bless you as you go.